Welcome to the Robert West Podcast, coming to you live from the Mobile Command Center like we do every Monday, because we're still working on our real studio. More on that later. So I was in the news today, looking at things, and uh, Sarah Palin's running for Congress out of Alaska. Excited about that. We'll get another good one up there. One of her opponents is a socialist from North Pole City, Alaska, and he has legally changed his name to Santa Claus. Surprise, surprise, he's a socialist. So for the three people up there in Alaska, please, please, please vote for Sarah Palin. Um, on behalf of myself and all the other elves out here that have to work all year long to provide the free gifts for the children, uh, we've provided enough. And for the children out there, grow up. If you're old enough to vote, you're old enough to vote for somebody besides Santa Claus. The other thing going on with Alaska is this is the first year they're using a thing called rank choice voting. Uh, it's something that I really support. We need to look at it here in Texas. We need to think about making it a national uh, way to vote. And it's just a lot better than any other system that I've seen for voting. When you gather up the list to go out and get ice cream, you know, you might have five or six people that want vanilla. You might have five or six people that want chocolate. You might have two or three oddballs that want strawberry. But when you come back, you don't look at the people that wanted strawberry and go, sorry, you don't get any ice cream because you weren't in the top two. You wasted your request. No, 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 no. You don't do that. When we send somebody out for ice cream, you go, hey, I really want chocolate. If you don't have that, get vanilla. If they don't have that, I'll take, I'll take strawberry. That's basically what ranked choice voting does. You get a ballot with three or four slots on it, and you put your choices in order. Now, in a real-world example, there might we might use the um, Bush, Clinton, Perot uh, race. There were a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that really, really wanted to vote for Perot, but they were so afraid that the other side would win that they didn't vote for Perot. We wound up splitting the vote about three ways, and Clinton won with a minority of the vote. That's not a good way to do things. That doesn't bring people together. It doesn't bring the country together. So what, how it would work with ranked choice voting is everybody that really wanted to vote for Perot could go ahead and vote for Perot. Because if he came in last, they would just take that stack of Perot ballots and they'd pick it up and go, okay, Perot didn't make it. Now, let's see here. Okay, second choice for this person was Clinton. Second choice for this person was Bush and Bush and Clinton and Bush and so on. Until you got somebody with 50% plus one of the vote. And then everybody that voted for Perot first and then Bush, if he won, he'd be happy. They, you know, they still got to vote. They didn't waste their vote. This would encourage more people to participate in our system. And the more people we have running and stepping up, the better chance they think they have winning. Their family shows up, their friends show up, their coworkers show up. And we get more voters involved, which is what we really need. And we get more first-timers involved, which is what we really desperately need. And it doesn't become this money game as nearly as much. And by the way, if you're concerned with money and politics, here's my solution. Everybody just take a vow. You're going to vote for whoever spends the less next time, you know, next time around. That would solve it in like two election cycles. People would be bragging about how little they spent. So me and my wife are going down to convention. Uh, this will be the second time we go, we're going. Last time we were delegates. This time around we're alternates, but it looks like we'll probably be seated. A lot of people that stood up and volunteered their time and volunteered their energy to go down there and be delegates for the convention have since pulled their name off the list. I don't understand that. Not in the numbers that we're seeing. In fact, we were told early on, if you're an alternate, go ahead and sign uh Go down to Houston. Go ahead and rent the hotel room because eventually you will be seated. A lot of people go down there and treat it as a reunion. They don't treat it as a civic duty. They don't treat it as the future of the state, the future of this nation, or that they're representing their county, people who can't be there because they got jobs and kids and things they have to do. So what I would like to see counties around Texas consider is a little rule for their county. that If you volunteer to be a delegate, and you change your mind. Short of a doctor's note, you can't be a delegate next time around. You can't even ask to be. You've already proven you, you won't be there. 
If you're an alternate, do go down there and wait your turn because even though you have delegates, those people will need to sleep sometime or maybe they won't show up on time. When this happens, you can be seated and you'll have a voice and a vote. So go down there, treat it like the duty it is. It's only three days. You can concentrate, get the business done. There's plenty of time after and before to mingle and meet with old friends. I'm looking forward to that part of it. But when we're there and we're doing business, that's 100% is going to be my focus. And that should be everybody's focus. So I talked about trying to vote for somebody who spends the least on an election. And I'm a kind of a frugal guy. My wife is even more frugal than I am. That's Scottish for cheap. Um, but let's go into the mechanics of planning out an election. What goes into it? If you've never really thought about it, you've never even wondered about it, uh, more than you think goes into it. There's fundraisings. There's uh, communications. There's the, Somebody's got to handle all the data. Make sure you're not wasting your time. There's a political aspect to it. You're reaching out to other people trying to get their endorsement, trying to get them to back you. Uh, there's also the field operations. People have to put out signs and not knock on doors and make phone calls. There's a lot that goes into an election. And the bigger the election, the more people is involved. And, and now, right now, there's also a thing, you know, this whole social media thing. So you've got to get somebody to put your word out. Holy smokes, how many places are there to put your word out, right? Rumble, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, ugh, what, a dozen at least? And, and for sure, the one that you leave off will be the one someone gets upset that you didn't do because that's their favorite. I get asked all the time, why are you not on Truth Social? And I'm like, well, that's easy. I don't have an iPhone. Once they figure that out, maybe I'll be on there. But in the meantime, I'm not buying an Apple product just to be on one place. It just doesn't make sense to me. So why would you go through this? Why would you go through all the trouble to plan out an actual election? Well, to see what's involved, of course. But once you have an election strategy, an election plan, all planned out, when you go to ask somebody to run that you trust, that you would really like to see in office, most of the work's done. It's an easier sale. Look, I did all this planning. I've got it figured out. This is how many people we need. This is, you know, the office space that you need. You know, who's going to run operations? Well, somebody has to get the coffee and keep the lights on and sweep up when everything's done. That's operations. Those are the people that handle the facility. Then you've got your block walkers and such. And I would recommend hiring somebody very young to do your social media thing. They're just better at it than somebody like myself would be. So... You can get all these different age groups involved with all these different talents. And that would be exciting. The more people you get involved, the better. And once it's all planned out, well, maybe you could look at it and say, you know, I planned it all out. I can probably do this. And I'm better than what we've got. A lot of times I get accused of trying to find perfection in a candidate. Well, there's only one person that's perfect, and that was 2,000 years ago, and we're not going to, any of us, live up to that. But the truth is, I'm not looking for perfection. That would be a s silly thing to look for. I'm looking for better. Texas deserves better. This nation deserves better. And that's why I'm asking you to get involved. I'm asking you to step up and run or find good people to run. But in the meantime, get a book on how to run a campaign. Get a book on how to win a, a local election, school board. How to win a state election, state legislature, state senator, whatever, and get involved. We had a lot of great people got involved last time around. And we kind of hit a brick wall. We had a very short season for election. We had a lot of money pouring into Texas. There was a lot of emotion involved. And we just didn't really do very well with getting patriots in there over the politicians. But we did have some victories. We had five or six five-star plan uh, endorsed candidates that won their election. And that's awesome. That's a, that's a good first start. About 12 months from now, you can mark it on your calendar, about 12 months from now, you can start gathering signatures to get on the ballot for the next primary. 18 months from now is the cutoff to sign up to run. You better start planning now if you want to win. 
we didn't have that much lead time leading up to the last election, but we'll have it this time around. So for all these people out there, so the primaries are over. No, the primaries are never over. There's another one on the way. And we need to do it fast, folks. We see political violence happening every day in this country. There was more than half a dozen vandalism attacks, arson, what have you, on pregnancy centers. And all these pregnancy centers do is provide diapers and baby formula when they can get it. They provide counseling. They try to get people to not have an abortion. They're not kidnapping them. They're not forcing them. They're just handing them pamphlets and explaining things to them. And for that, the left is doing a coordinated attack against them. Supreme Court Justice just missed being assassinated the other day. The guy already had the padding on his boots. He had the weapons. He drove all the way from California to D.C. And there's proof. If he hadn't have got to the justice, he would have got to his family. That's not how we have a civil society. And it's not going to be long until the other side decides to start shooting back. And that's when it starts. Now, if you're not familiar with the fall of Rome, Rome was a great republic. They had a senate. They had a head of state called a Caesar, but he wasn't a king. They hated kings. They hated tyrants. And as soon as they had one, then they had another one, and they had another one, and the whole thing came apart. That was too much power in one person's hands. And that's what you saw across the the nation the last two years. Too much power in one person's hands. And it didn't matter if they're Republicans or Democrats. When you put that much power in somebody's hands, even if you have a good one, eventually you wind up with a bad one. Even if somebody's honest and, and doing the best job they can, they can make mistakes. That's why we have a separation of powers. That's why one set of people write the laws, one set of people enforce the laws, one set of people judge the laws. Because having one person do all three, look where it put this country. Look where it put each of the states. We had three million people put out of work. That's more jobs than were created in the last 10 years in Texas. We had tens of thousands of small businesses destroyed. Now, our constitution, both the federal and the state constitution, says the government cannot take, damage, or destroy private property without just cause, a system, and just compensation in advance of the taking. Those people didn't get any kind of compensation when you took their livelihood away. Well, speaking of that, how many people got an invite to Greg Abbott's reception down in Houston? Woo! Personal invite right to his reception. Notice it's not at the convention, folks. That's how much Greg Abbott cares about the Republican Party of Texas. He's not showing up again. He got embarrassed into donating to it. But he ain't going to come on stage. He's afraid to look bad if he gets booed. Now, he's the nominee. He's the nominee for the Republican Party. But he won't show up at the convention. Well, I'm not too thrilled with his actions the last two years. But... I don't know if he can't show up to our convention, I really can't show up for his election. And that's my take on it. It's my vote. It's your vote too. And if you reward a guy for being a tyrant, you're voting for tyranny and you'll get more of it. So, Father's Day is coming up. Uh, as a person that's received a lot of ugly ties in my life, I'd rather have something else. So we've got a thing going on. The Five Star Plan book has been discounted. It costs less than a tie. It'll last longer. It looks better. And uh, I think Dad might like it a little bit more. This book has gotten a lot of praise from people. Uh, people like Shelley Luther, Brian Slayton, um, Senator Bob Hall, who wrote the forward for us. Those people were bragging on me, not me. Uh, had Mothers contact me, said they're using it to teach uh, Texas civics to their kids. Uh, had attorneys contact me, said they've read it three times and they keep getting more out of it. For a lot of people out there that saw the book, they kind of picked up pieces and parts of it. And they really focused on it and they forgot about the rest of it. 
So there's a there's a chapter in there on the precinct chair strategy. About a third of the precinct chair seats were empty when I wrote the book. That has since been largely fixed. Uh, my wife and I have rented tables at gun shows. We've gotten people involved in a weekend. Maybe we've get 20 or 30 people to volunteer to be precinct chairs. So we could fill those empty seats. We talked hundreds of people, or gave them the idea at least, to run for these precinct chairs. And a lot of them won the election. And they're seated now, and they're moving forward. But the book was never really, that wasn't the focus of it. It was just one strategy. There's a whole section in there that if you're thinking about stepping up, you really want to get involved and you want to solve things, that's going to be you finding good people to run or you being that good person that runs. And it lists all of these elected uh, offices in Texas and exactly what they do. If you don't know what a precinct commissioner does in your county, how would you know if you'd be a good one or if you even are interested in? If you don't know what a county judge does when they're doing the job they're supposed to do instead of being a little pissant kings, then that's the book for you. We need good people to step up. This book gives you an outline of what each of these positions do, their responsibilities, and if you'd be a good fit. Because all of us have different talents. I'd be a lousy treasurer. I'm better at literature. You do the math. So I'm encouraging everybody, if you haven't picked up the book, go ahead and get it. If your dad doesn't have a copy, order it. Uh, we've got a thing on Etsy. We're running a great sale. And I'll go ahead and sign it for you. And uh, we'll get it out there. We'll make a difference. This last year, we made a difference. Me and my wife, that is our entire team. She is my only people. And just two people. We filled literally hundreds of precinct chair seats. We got the Republican Party for the first time in a long time to get serious about filling precinct chair seats. There were entire counties taken over by first-time precinct chair holders. They were sworn in as volunteers. They got active. They pushed the old elites out. And now they run that county organization. We need to do more of that. Fifteen counties censured Greg Abbott. The elite came back hard against them. They found people to run against those county chairs. They, ran, they found a lot of people to run against those precinct chairs. For the most part, those people defended their titles, defended their precinct chair positions, defended their county chair positions, because the people really appreciated that somebody would stand up for them, because their state legislators didn't do it. And it explains in the book that the state legislatures, they have a safety valve for an out-of-control executive with too much power. At any time, they could have pulled the cord and called a special session. And you can go online and find out about it. Don't let people lie to you and say that only the governor can call a special session. You can look up Texas Code 665.04 and read it yourself. The speaker could call it. Anybody could call it. I was down at Tomball not long ago. I was talking to Valerie Swanson, and she said she didn't know anything about it in front of a room full of people who just voted to send her back for the umpteenth time. Now, either she's really, really bad at her job, or she's a liar. One of the two. Because if, if you join the Navy, the first thing they train you to do is fight fires. If you join, uh, if you go to work at a refinery, the first thing they teach you to do is, you know, the safety valve. That's just common sense. So for the state legislatures not to know that their safety valve, that their firefighting, 665.04, that's your only tool to stop an out-of-control executive branch. For them to not know about it, it's just silly. I've been talking about it for two years. I know people have heard me. So, these people in Austin did not stand up for you. They stood up and stood aside for Greg Abbott. And then when we finally called a session, they brought up what Matt Rinaldi described as the single worst piece of legislation he has ever seen in the state of Texas. That was in the regular session. It was House Bill 3. And House Bill 3, it was purported to rein in 
government overreach, executive overreach. But it did exactly the opposite, folks. It said whoever sits in the governor's chair, now this is the important part, it doesn't say when Greg Abbott sits in the governor's chair, it says whoever sits in the governor's chair from now on can declare an emergency and there's nobody that can argue with him. And he can declare that emergency and run it for 30 days before he has to run it again. Well, guess what? We're still under the emergency orders. Greg Abbott keeps just renewing them and renewing them and renewing them. He could write anything he wants on a piece of paper and send it out right now as an executive order. And who would protect you and your rights? But this House Bill 3 said he could call an emergency for any reason, at any time, for as long as he wanted. He could write laws without calling them laws. Line 7 sticks in my head. Line 7 says, this bill authorizes cooperation between all entities in the state of Texas. Doesn't sound like a bad thing. Is cooperation illegal? Hmm. It authorizes cooperation. Except that's not what authorize means in a legal dictionary. Authorize means to compel obedience. When you authorize your bank to transfer five thousand dollars, it's not because your bank really wanted to. It's because you're ordering them to. They don't have a choice. You're compelling obedience. So let's let's take that word authorize cooperation and say compels cooperation between all entities in the state of Texas. You know you're an entity. So is your business. So is your child. I don't need to be compelled to cooperate in any sort of emergency just on the whim of one person. And here's the scary part, folks. Only four Republican representatives voted against it. Only four. I'm not even going to tell you which four. I want you to go to the Texas government website, look it up for yourself, and find out if your representative voted for or against it. This law is horrible. It doesn't take long to read it. Read it. Imagine if you were living under it right now and what it could mean to future generations and for your children and for their children. And then call up your state rep, write your state rep, however you need to get a hold of them, and ask why they voted for it. This is one of the few times where I will ever give a compliment to the Democrats down in Austin. But more Democrats voted against it than Republicans. So until next time, keep it up and uh, see you on the flip side.